Good morning to you, wherever you are. It's great to be able to worship with you today. And it's an important day in our church calendar as we reflect on Christ being the King, the Lord of our lives, and the one who is over all situations. You know, the times when we face difficulties and when life seems hard, he ultimately is our strength and our hope. And as we worship together this morning, let us rest in that strength and in the hope that he has overcome all things. Let us pray. Faithful one, whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us spend a few moments reflecting on verses from a beautiful psalm, Psalm 28. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help as I lift up my hands towards your most holy place. We pray to you, the one whose strength endures, regardless of any situation or circumstance. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. We thank you that you hear us and that you respond to us in love. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. To know you is my joy and my strength. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. And we know that when we spend time in your presence, we receive the strength we need to face whatever the day may bring.
as we come now to a time of confession, let us reflect on these words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You know, our hearts become troubled and fearful as we create distance between ourselves and God. And aligning ourselves to his will and obeying all he has called us to do brings us to that intimate place where we don't only know his words, but we can feel his closeness, his strength and his love. So let us take a moment to ponder, is there anything separating us from him? Are we taking time to know him better? Do we rest in his strength or continue to try and fight in our own way? Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws and we have left undone those things that we ought to have done and we have done those things that we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, sinners. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous and godly life to the glory of your holy name amen and may the god of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in christ our lord amen Faithful. So unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace, Lord of all. I depend.
commands, decrees and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flying with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. The Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert on the law, tested him with the question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. It's really good to be with you today. My name is Ian. Well, you may notice a picture over my shoulder here. This is a picture of Travone. It's a place that's really been important in my life and also in my marriage. Uh, in fact, it's an incredibly <laughs> a special place for Vicky and her family. Well, when I married Vicky, it was with a commitment. It wasn't based on uh, some kind of condition. I made commitments to love her with all that I am in sickness and in health, whether I'm rich or poor. And also, interestingly, it says two things. It says, forsaking all others and till death are stupid. In other words, no other person can get in the way. It doesn't matter about possessions. It doesn't matter about money. And it also is a sense of, there's a sense of timelessness about it. In other words, for all of my mortal life, I will love and be committed to Vicky. That is the picture of marriage. Well, today we're going to continue looking at what it is to be one with God, to be in relationship, to be on a journey with God. And we've been looking at the Shema. And if you're not familiar with that, just turn, turn over to Deuteronomy 6. It's all there. But basically what we see is a a, an exploration or an explanation of how we are to follow and be in relationship with God. Firstly, we are to listen to him without exception, getting rid of anything that gets in the way of us hearing him. We are to call him Lord. In other words, we are to proclaim him as our God and we are to follow him. And then we are to love him. And it goes beyond just a gushy gushy kind of love. We are to love with our heart and our soul. In other words, with our very being. And in today, in our final instalment about what the Shema is, we're going to be looking at strength. Now, it's not the kind of strength you may have in mind. It's not the brute strength or the force of will that is being talked about in the Shema. No, it's something so much bigger. And I think this video will be really helpful as we start to explore what, sh what strength is for us today. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the last word, strength. The Hebrew word is ma'od, and it occurs some 300 times in the scriptures, and it doesn't actually mean strength. There is a perfectly good word for strength in Hebrew, and ma'od is not it. In fact, the Shema is one of the only places in the whole Bible where ma'od is translated as strength. So, what's up with that? The most common meaning of ma'od is very or much. It's what grammar nerds call an adverb, a word that comes alongside other words to augment their meaning. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, God looks at the world that he's made and six times he calls it good. But then the climactic seventh time, he says, it is ma'od good, that is, very good. Later in Genesis, in the story of Noah, the flood waters keep rising and they become ma'od powerful or extremely powerful over the land. 
In the story of Cain and Abel, Cain wasn't just angry at his brother, he was ma'od angry. Or when Saul became the king of Israel, he was ma'od happy. So you can see why ma'od occurs hundreds of times in the Bible. It's a really common Hebrew word that intensifies the meaning of other words. Very this, or really that. However, biblical authors could use ma'od in ways that are unique. Like when they want to increase a word's force to total capacity, they'll say ma'od twice. So Jacob became ma'od ma'od wealthy with flocks and camels and donkeys and servants. Or the Israelite spies went to investigate the promised land and they say, the land we pass through is ma'od ma'od good. So it's pretty clear, ma'od doesn't mean strength in terms of muscle power, but rather very or much. So let's come back to the Shema, where people are called to love God with all of their heart, that is their will and affections, and with all of their soul, that is their whole life and physical being, and with all of their ma'od, that is with all of their muchness. And while that sounds kind of funny, you also kind of get it. If ma'od can intensify any word's meaning to total capacity, then this final thing that you use to love God isn't a thing at all. It's actually everything. Loving God with your ma'od means devoting every possibility, opportunity, and capacity that you have to honoring God and loving your neighbor as yourself. It's the most wide and expansive word in the Shema. Ma'od can refer to almost anything. Which raises one last and really fascinating point. Because this word was capable of many nuances of meaning, ancient Jewish communities interpreted ma'od in the Shema in different ways. So the ancient Jewish scholars who translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, when they came to ma'od in the Shema, they translated it with the Greek word dunamis, that is power or strength. This is the interpretation adopted by most modern translations. But if you look at the ancient Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible, you'll discover that these scholars interpreted ma'od to mean wealth. Money is a concrete thing that opens up all kinds of opportunities to love God by giving away resources. And when Jesus was asked about the most important command in scripture, he quoted the Shema. And he used two words to unpack the meaning of ma'od. He said, love God with all of your mind and with all of your power. Both are human capacities that can be used to love God in an infinite number of ways. So which of these interpretations of ma'od is right? Does it mean strength or wealth or mind? That's the wrong question. The word ma'od doesn't limit the number of ways you can show love for God, just the opposite. The point is that everything in a person's life, every moment and every opportunity, every ability and capacity offers a chance to love and honor the one who made you. It's a call to love God with all of your muchness. And that's the meaning of strength in the Shema. Well, I hope that was a really helpful exploration of what mi'od is. And we're going to refer back to that quite a bit during this talk. But before we do, I'll just explain a bit more about this picture. This is Travone Beach. For many of you may be familiar with it, a great surfing beach, a great place for building sandcastles as my three boys um, definitely know about. They love that place, as do we. Well, it's also a place where Vicky and I um, spent quite a bit of time as we were getting to know each other. Um, it's been an important part of our marriage, of in a sense of who we are, part of our identity. We're drawn to this place. We're drawn, in a sense, to the memories as well that we've created in that place. And interestingly, many of you will already know this, Travone is going to be part of the benefits that I will be serving as the rector or the vicar of um, uh, in the new year, which is really exciting for us. Now, I'll come back to that because it does have significance to the message today. But let's turn our minds back to this word mi'od. Well, we see in this, in this passage in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, when we look at the Shema and we also look at Jesus' interpretation of what is the greatest commandment, which is to love God, the Shema, in a sense, tells us how we are to love God. And we see that in this message that it's all about being in deeper relationship with God. To, to mi'od God is to give all that we are to him. In other words, we can't hold anything back. Imagine in marriage, if you committed only up to a certain point or you loved, but you didn't give all of yourself to the other person. You couldn't actually, with great integrity, say you love the person. And actually, when you make the marriage vows as well, you can't say, I'm going to give you everything for richer, for poorer, for, for
for sickness and health and all the other commitments that you're making. It, that those, in a sense, are commitments that demonstrate something gr much bigger than the simple commitments by, by word. What you're trying to say is, I'm going to give you all that I am. And the picture throughout the Bible of being in a relationship with God, the picture is always about being married to God. In fact, God describes his people as being his bride. And when they go astray, he has some fairly harsh words to say about them, but it's always in the context of wanting a deep relationship with them. The great thing is that we see in the work and the words and the ministry of Jesus, in a sense, is an unpacking of what the Shema looks like. What does it look like to love God? And Jesus says, you are to love God, but you are also to love other people. And we see Jesus reaching out and in that picture of him walking alongside his disciples for those three years as he gathered them together. They were a ragtag bunch of misfits in a way, but he, he walked alongside them. In a sense, he put his arms around them and he said, this is how you are to live and love God. But also the interesting picture there is of doing it together. In other words, you're not just on a journey with Jesus, but you're with that ragtag group of people. You are in it together. And we see in the end, when Jesus dies and rises again, that the message has fully sunk in. In other words, they start to embody what it is to mi'od God, to love with all that they are. And they establish the church amid suffering, but also um, with incredible joy and clarity of purpose. And that is what we have inherited as the church. When Jesus' enemies or his detractors um, asked him, a, a, in a sense, a leading question, what is the greatest commandment, in which we see in, in the reading from Matthew, he, he then goes on to say, well, you're to love God. And immediately his listeners would have thought, ah, oh, he's referring to the Shema, which would have been, in a sense, in multicolour, technicolour, in terms of understanding what it is to love God. You are to listen, you are to, you are to call him Lord, you are to love God with all your um, mind, heart and soul. And also, interestingly, he adds to it. He says, you're not just to love God, but actually your love for God should flow into your love of other people. There's an interesting thing. If we are to fully understand what it is to love God, then it means we are compelled, as it were. We will naturally love other people. In fact, not to demonstrate love or connectedness with other people is in a sense to lack a full understanding of what it is to follow God and that is why the church is people not buildings it's all about us gathering together demonstrating the love of God by being together by worshiping together by praying together by sharing together as well now admittedly Today, in lockdown, um, with everything that we can't do together, this is a very a difficult pill to swallow, as it were. But it's really important to understand that we, even if we're physically separated, we can still be connected. We can still go deep together as well. It may take a bit of extra effort. Just imagine the first church. They were being persecuted. They were, in a sense, being dissuaded from being together. Those first Christians were um, incredible, were, were really suffering. And it, if you look back to when the Shema was given, it was given as the nation of Israel was established. And where were those people? Well, they were in the desert. They had no home. They were, in a sense, scattered. They, they were wandering around. But God says, you are my people. You are to love me. And, in this, and the pictures of them doing it together. In other words, what Jesus says clarifies what was going on at the establishment of the people of God. If you think of it as a, at a basic level, God created us with a family, with a mother and a father for many of us. Um, but he also created us with a desire to be in relationship with other people. He gave, gave us families. He gave us friends and then he invites us into a church to be together. In other words, there's a picture which is quite a triune image of loving, of being together, of wanting to be in community and communion with each other. When we are together, we please God, we grow closer together, 
but we also demonstrate what MIOD is. Now, it's obviously a very difficult time at the moment, but, and remember, the, the world is, is all about individuality. It's not about gathering together. It's, oftentimes it's about giving what you want, uh, not giving everything away, not being wholehearted in everything we do, but actually just giving what we have to. It's very transactional. Um, and yet God says very clearly, the way in which you love me, the way in which you are my people, is to do it with all that you are. We are to mi'od at all times. We are to give it all. Now, you may be looking in on Christian things, and this may all seem a bit strange um, or different, or maybe you haven't come across this before, but just imagine this. If God has created you, if God then through his son Jesus gave all of himself to be in deeper relationships, he gave it all. He went through pain and suffering for you and for me. What should we do? What should our response be? Is it just to give a little bit? Is it just to give us a bit, an hour on a Sunday perhaps? Or maybe if you're watching this with the, the fast forward, you're just going to watch a little bit or what you want to consume. What, how are we to respond to God? Is it with a, just a bit of us or is it me odd? All, all of who we are, with all of our treasures, with all of our time, with all of our energy, with all of our emotion, with all of our love, all of who we are. The good news that one day soon we will be able to stop being just a virtual church and be a real church of gathering together. I don't know about you, but I really miss seeing people, touching them, hugging them, being with them, singing. And I miss doing that with you. But it's very tempting, isn't it, to have a seg segmented life of not give all that we are. Or maybe we've not got a completely full understanding of what it is to be a follower of Jesus what it is to me odd in our faith. Now, it is also quite tempting to, in that segmented life, to be an orange rather than an apple. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, to get to the fruit, you have to go through a skin. And actually, if you bite straight into it, it can be a bit bitter. That's one way of looking at it. The other thing, way of looking at it, is we can have a segment in our life that is just for faith of following Jesus of praising God or praying and then what happens when that happens in a day we've done the God slot and the rest of our life continues almost unconnected with um, our faith or we can be an apple our faith our life can be like an apple. Now, the thing is, when you bite into an apple, what happens? Well, it doesn't actually matter where you bite. It should be the same taste, it should be the same texture, and it should be the same flavour as well. So, as I bite this apple, it doesn't matter where I bite it, it will taste the same. Now, in an orange, you may think, you know, in terms of your life, you may think, well, I've got a segment for family, I've got a segment for friendships, I've got a segment for hobbies, I've got a segment for work. Um, inevitably, there's a segment for maintaining my house or my car. And there'll be other segments. The image of faith, the image of following God, of being a follower of God, of loving him is that actually we don't have segments in our life. It means that we are in fellowship with God, no matter where we are, whether we're working, whether we're in friendship, whether we're doing hobbies, whether we're at home or um, out and about having a coffee, whether we're in church. Do you see what I mean? We're not designed to be segmented people. That is what the world imposes on us. Now, if you fast forward a bit, you'll, you'll be familiar with the passage in Matthew 28 where Jesus commissions his disciples. So remember, he's accompanied them. He's shown them how to love God and he's done it together with them. Um, but then he says, go make disciples of all nations. Now, you can read that. Uh, that's the Great Commission. You can read that as, um, as if 
the main word is go. We've got to go for it. We've got to go somewhere new. We've got to go. Actually, God has planted you where he wants you now. In other words, where we go, it, we're probably already doing the things, the activities that God has always intended for us. But the main activity in the commission is making disciples. And the image there is of journeying with other people, of going deeper in relationship with them, but also in God, with God. And so the everyday matters. Where you are working matters to God. Your faith should mid all things. It should be involved in all things. In other words, we are disciple makers no matter where we are, whether we're working at home, whether we're um, retired and have hobbies, or whether we're demolishing the Trinity Centre. Wherever we are, we are disciple makers. That doesn't change. The Great Commission, the purpose of the church, means getting out of our comfort zone. It means not keeping church, our faith, as just a little segment of our life. But it means that it should flow through everything that we do in our lives. It means that we may need to reimagine our purpose as well. Maybe the purpose of our perhaps slightly cosy small groups and home groups. It may mean that we need to start making more of an effort to connect and reconnect with one another. Now, the great thing is that God doesn't invite us to do all this out of our own strength. In fact, he commits to strengthen us. As part of the Great Commission, um, Jesus says, I will be with you to the very end of the age. In other words, he's given us all that we need. He's given those first disciples what they needed and look what happened. The church grew incredibly, but it's actually God who strengthens us. It's not, that's, that's why it can be slightly confusing about loving God with all our strength. But actually, when actually he's the one who strengthens us to give all that we are, wherever we are. I'm just going to go back to the picture over my shoulder, the Travon. The interesting thing is that um, 13 or maybe 14 years ago now, Vicky and I went there together for the first time to that beach. Now it's a place that Vicky had been to for many years before that but it was actually really important for her that I liked that place and so we went there and actually and since then we've spent a lot of time on that beach. It's a place where our children really like and a few weeks ago I was called by the church in Padstay which includes Travone uh, and a number of surrounding churches to become their rector, to lead them. Now, I have to say, it makes it so much easier knowing the place. In other words, it feels very much as though God has prepared me. He's given me a wonderful wife and Vicky, who loves me obviously, but also has a heart for the place that we're going. I feel very much as though God has held us has strengthened us, has led us to this point. God has laid down a challenge for us as well. He said, will you go with all that you are? Will you be yourself? Will you give your heart and your soul and your mirrored to me in this place? Now, God has called you to a place. God has called you to people. He has prepared you. He has given you the right relationships. He has given you everything of himself. The question for you and I today is this. Will we meet odds, God? Will we love him with all that we are? Will we serve him with all that we are? Will we be an apple, not an orange, in our approach to life and faith? So here's a little challenge for you. Why not try and explore today, almost immediately after the service, just find some time, or maybe right now just pause and say, God, I want to give all to you. I want to admit all to you. I want to acknowledge that you are my Lord. I want to listen to you with all that I am. I want to love you with all my heart and my soul. And I want to admit all. I want to give it all, use all of that I am for you. And the interesting thing is that when we, when we say that, when we pray those prayers, when we spend time seeking God, 
he is always found. He always responds. He always shows us how to love him. Now, maybe you're listening in for the first time. Maybe you're looking in on Christian things um, and you're wondering, well, how can I have a relationship with this God who's given me all? How can I have a relationship? We'll start getting to know um, Jesus. Well, there are a couple of practical things you can do, like you can read Mark's gospel, which only takes 90 minutes. Maybe you can have a chat with someone you know who is following Jesus. But I'd also encourage you to say a prayer and just say, which is basically a conversation with God and say, God, I acknowledge that you love me, that you've given all to me and for me through Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I want to may God show me what it is to give all that I am. And I pray also that you would get rid of all those things that are getting in the way of a relationship with you. And you know what the incredible thing is, as you pray that prayer, as you open yourself up to God, he absolutely loves it. He wants to draw near. Well, we're at the close now of the talk, um, but I want to end it with a prayer that um, many of us haven't said for a long time. It's the prayer that happens right after communion. A com now, communion is something we're all missing, um, breaking the bread together, being in communion together uh, and, and receiving the body and the blood of Jesus together. Now, this is a prayer that many of us will say, but perhaps we say almost um, by rote. Um, but I'd just like us to reflect on these words, because I think they really speak to us today. It's the prayer immediately after communion, which says this. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. This prayer is one of acknowledging that we have been strengthened. We have been given all that we need and we're asking God to send us out. It's interesting that it uses the word work in there a living sacrifice of being led by the Spirit. And so as we look at the words on the screen, maybe reflect on what that prayer is really saying. Because if we're really serious about being sent out, it means that it doesn't matter where we are, we will be me'od, me'odding, as it were, with God. We'll be giving it all. It's also a very clear demonstration of the purpose of gathering together for that one hour on a Sunday is to equip us for the whole of life, for everything, and to demonstrate our faith wherever we are. And so maybe make that prayer your prayer this week. Every day, pray that prayer and ask God to send you out to reconnect, to connect with other people and uh, Let's see what happens. I'm going to hand back over to Howard and others who will be leading us through prayer now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, who, as your Son, is the radiance of your glory, the exact representation of your being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. We thank you, Father, that you are still working your purposes out through this extraordinary year. We pray that the leaders of our world tune in to you. For our government, for American leaders now and to come, and other global leaders, that they may act justly, love mercy and walk humbly, especially in relation to how to build back a fairer world after COVID and to the issues of climate change. We pray for our ministry team here at Holy Trinity. We choose one of them to bring before you now. May they continue to hear your voice as they lead us. We remember the many who continue to serve us, paid and unpaid, through the continuing pandemic. We lift particular people 
we know before you now. May your hand be upon them, renewing their strength. We remember all NHS staff, those in education, supermarket workers including delivery drivers, farmers, other retail and postal workers. We also pray for those who are furloughed again, those working from home, the unemployed and those under the threat of redundancy. We bring before you too, Lord, those who are sick, and we ask that may may know your healing, mercy and peace at this time. And finally, dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us hear and act on your voice to each one of us as individuals and in our communal life together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now let us say together the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And let us share together in today's worldwide prayer. God the Father, help us to hear the call of Christ the King and to follow in his service, whose kingdom has no end. For he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, one glory. Amen.
trust that you've been blessed during this time that we've had together. We really appreciate everyone who contributes to these gatherings and of course everyone at home who participates. I'm sure that each one of us is doing all we can to support those around us. And if at this time we can just maybe ponder on those different people who may just benefit from a smile, from a phone call, whatever, to help them in through these difficult times. And likewise, we want you to know that we are here for you too. We are only at the end of a phone or the end of an email. If you ring and let us know, we will get back in touch with you and pray with you and talk to you, whatever it needs to help in these difficult times. And as we leave, let us leave with a blessing. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. And let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen. Have a wonderful day.